Okay, folks, so we're back at another video. And what we've talked about so far is that we have an auto injector, the ASI unit. And that ASI unit, the auto sampler or injector, will actually inject my sample into the TOC instrument. And we said the very first place that this sample goes to is called the eight point valve. All right, so this is kind of our first step if we are tracking where the sample goes to. So after the eight point valve, in the last video, we talked about the purpose of the eight point valve. What does the eight points actually stand for? We also talked about how to replace the eight point valve and that it was a fairly cheap piece of uh, accessory that we can purchase uh, for maintenance on our TOC instrument. So after this, where does my sample go? What is the next piece or the uh, next thing that we need to talk about as far as tracking the flow of the sample? And the next place that we need to put our focus on is going to be the injection port. So we need to talk about the actual injection point, and this is mainly going to be a syringe. So here in this next slide, what you're going to see is the front cover of the TOC again. And this front cover, the door is now open, and the area that we want to focus on, the last video was the eight-point valve, and that was up here at the very top, right? And we talked about the motor. But down below this eight-point valve, we're going to see an area that has a syringe. That is the next stop for my sample as it travels through the TOC instrument. So this syringe is pretty special and the reason that I say that is because it's finely calibrated because this controls my injection amount. If my syringe kind of goes wonky then my injection amount is going to go wonky and then my data is not going to be consistent. So in other words if I'm supposed to inject five milliliters every single injection and my syringe messes up one of those times and it injects eight milliliters instead of five or three milliliters instead of five, then all of a sudden my sample could not be representative of what it's supposed to be because the sample amount, the proper sample amount, never made it to the instrument to get detected. This syringe is also a consumable area. So as you can imagine, over time, this syringe will begin to wear out. And there's a chance that I could just replace a part of the syringe, or there's also a chance that I will have to replace the entire syringe. But again, it's very easy. It's very accessible. They know that you're going to have to change this piece in part. They know that you are going to prefer to do it yourself. So they make it very easy to do so. But that is the area that we're going to be focused on in this video. It's the syringe piece. What does the syringe actually do? How to replace that syringe? Uh, and what are my options? Okay. How often do you have to do this? Uh, well, the answer here is that really depends on your sample. All right. So, for instance, we've had our TOC machine now for about eight years, and we've never really had to replace that syringe. Again, one of the reasons is we only use it, you know, a handful of months out of the year. Uh, this is not something that stays on every day uh, throughout the week, throughout the year. If it did, then that syringe would probably have to re be replaced every couple of months, every six months maybe. It just really depends on the dirtiness or how filthy your samples really are. Okay, so this syringe is very easy to replace. It's not a big deal. And again, I'll show you a video here in just a second. So if I'm looking at my schematic, the area that we're looking at right now is right here. And this is my syringe piece, okay? The reason that I keep going back to this schematic is you're probably going to see this again, right? It's probably going to be on a test. It's going to be on a, maybe an assignment, and it will have all of these blocked out. You will not see the word syringe there. And it's going to say, possibly, label it. What is that piece called? And hopefully you can go in and label it as a syringe. So what I want to do now is kind of zoom in on that area that we just circled. And here is a closer snapshot of the syringe on the front of the GC, or the, not the GC, but the TOC instrument. 
so this syringe is a glass syringe, uh, and if you look up here at the very top, you're also going to see kind of a plunger. Uh, it looks like a plastic or Teflon plunger up here at the very top, uh, and this really creates a seal inside of the syringe because the last thing that you want is for it to suck liquid into the syringe and for it to leak out of here at the bottom. So this has to be a pretty tight fit uh, or this whole entire system is not going to work for you. Okay. Uh, the purpose of the syringe over here, it's going to inject your sample. All right. We kind of know that. That is the purpose of the syringe. It should be injecting a certain amount every single time with every single sample. So it's going to be injecting the sample for me. I do not really have to do that myself. Number two, it can also mix. And when I talk about mixing, what I'm really referring to is maybe your standard prep uh, or mixing some of your sample. Now, what is it actually mixing? All right, well, if it's sample that you have injected, normally what it does mix is a little bit of acid, and that acid is hydrochloric acid. We'll talk about why, again, a little bit later on, but it does inject some acid into your samples, and it's supposed to mix the acid with your sample before it gets injected. And a lot of people just don't understand that that's the case, but it is. The other thing that it can actually mix are your standards. So if your standards are getting injected, it can actually take part of your master standard, mix it with a little bit of acid, of course, because you want to treat everything the same, and it will also mix with it some water, and that water is DI water. This has the capability of making standards for you. Now, when I talk about standards, what we're really referring to here is going to be a sample with a known concentration. And we're going to look at the signal that we get for that concentration. All right. This is the whole concept of standards every single time that we make them. So, for instance, I'm going to make a hundred part per million standard. And I will run that standard in the TOC instrument and I will get a signal from that 100 ppm. And then I might make a 10 part per million. And then I'll get a signal for that one, right? And then I'll get a one part per million and I'll get a signal for that one. And then what will happen is that I'll run my standards or my samples. So as my samples are beginning to run, I'm getting a number. Well, where does that number fit? Is that number between 1 to 10? Is that number between 10 to 100? That is the whole purpose of the set of standards that I'm making. It allows me to take my samples that have an unknown concentration, I take the number that I'm getting from it, and I compare that to known concentrations and their signals. That is how the TOC instrument works, and that's really how all equipment works in a laboratory. Good news is that the TOC makes these for you. So you do not have to go through the process of making maybe a set of five or a set of seven standards to run on the machine. You tell it what you want it to make, and it will make it on its own. And it does that by diluting a more concentrated standard with water. So it pulls in a little bit of standard that you give it from the beginning and then it pulls in the perfect amount of water and it pulls both of those into the syringe and it gives it a good mix and then it injects that mixture onto the TOC instrument and it will make the standards for you. This is something that you do not have to do which makes running standards on this instrument uh, very very nice right and it's also a uh, time saver as well. Finally, the other thing that the syringe does is that it will begin to purge. So we've talked about this whole NPOC and POC, non-purgeable organics and purgeable organics. So this is the area that gets rid of the purgeable organics for you. Now the way that it does it is that it uses air, all right? It's another reason that we have an air tank hooked up to the instrument. So it's going to purge 
by literally taking a straw in a way and blowing air through it, just like you would if you put the straw down into some soda and you blew in the soda, right? When you do that, you are bubbling all the CO2, the carbonation, out of the soda sample. Well, this is the same kind of concept that's happening here. So here is my airline. So that piece of tubing that's coming off from the side, right? You can kind of track it. It starts up in here, and then you can track it through here and around and inside of the syringe. That is a air tubing line, okay? So as your sample or as your standard gets sucked up into the syringe, it's going to inject that eventually, but before it does it, it's going to bubble air through it. So if you have this door open and you sit and you watch it inject a sample and all of the steps that come along with it, you are going to see a step in the TOC where air is bubbling from the side and you will see those bubbles travel through your sample just like if you were blowing in the straw in your soda, right? And it's going to do that for a certain amount of time. What it's doing is that it's driving off all of the purgeable organics at this point. So all the purgeables are getting ready to go away. And we are going to be left with the non-purgeables, which is what this TOC machine will begin to analyze and begin to report on. All right. So that tubing is very important. You have to have that tubing on the syringe because if you do not then we have a problem and that means that this air cannot go into that sample and bubble out all of those purgeables that we do not want to measure. Everything's got to stay consistent, right? This syringe again is very easy to change. So over time this will get crudded, it will get dirty, it will get filthy and this piece of rubber up here at the top that could also begin to dry rot a little bit or not have a complete seal. So how do we change this syringe? Well, you see this big knob down here at the very bottom. This knob basically you uh, is a screw. So you basically just unscrew it. That's all that you have to do. And then this air tubing, we typically take the air tubing off as well. So this gets unscrewed and that just pops off from the side. And you just take the syringe and you pull it out of the machine. That's all that you got to do, folks. So when you pull that out of the machine, the whole thing will come out, all right, as one entire piece. You can see that screw down at the bottom that was holding the syringe in place. It's still right there. And then notice you don't see that plastic tubing coming off on the side anymore. That has also been unscrewed and pulled over to the side, so that way we can hook that back up to our new syringe when we put one on. Uh, replacement of the syringe, it's not very fun to your wallet. That syringe is typically going to run around 500 bucks a piece. So if you have to replace the entire assembly, then this is how much you're going to be expected to pay on any kind of given year. You're looking at five to six hundred bucks here. So this piece is not cheap, and this is another reason that cleanliness is important. Make sure that you have clean samples. Make sure that you are rinsing your instrument out enough after the sample gets injected before you bring your next sample on board. Not only does it help with cross-contamination, but it's also going to help keeping your system clean and all the pieces and parts that come along with it. Again, we are super clean. Uh, we, I know we um, don't use it as much as industry uses it, but at the same time, we have went years without replacing the syringe because we know if we keep it clean, we can prevent some of this stuff from happening. Okay, so I've got a video that kind of shows you how to replace this syringe. I'll show you that video in just a second. Uh, but the other option here, if you don't want to replace the entire syringe, you can also replace just that piece of plastic um, uh, septa at the very top, that plunger basically, the plunger tip. Uh, and that plunger tip is going to be right here. So if you take the syringe off, just like I described uh, just a few seconds ago, you can take this insert of the syringe completely out. And when you do that, you are exposing this plunger tip right here at the very end. 
The only thing that you have to do is take a knife, literally a knife, and cut that completely open and slide this plunger tip off of the end of that syringe. This plunger tip, if that's the only thing that you have to replace, that is much better on your wallet and your pocketbook than the entire syringe, okay? Up here at the very top or in the middle, you're seeing a new plunger tip over to the right hand side. That's this piece here. And this is going to basically sit into the seat. Uh, that's kind of what we call that. Uh, so when you cut the old plunger tip off, then you can take the stick, basically, the stem of the needle, and set it down into the seat that will have on the inside the new plunger tip. You just give it a good push down. That's all that you have to do. And when you do that, that plunger tip will secure itself on the stem of the needle, and then you just insert that entire new assembly back into the glass syringe that you had before. So this way you are only purchasing the plunger tips and you're not purchasing the entire syringe as a whole. Uh, what's the cost difference? Well, if it's just the tip that you are having problems with, then that's good news for you because the new plunger tips run about 30 bucks a piece. And that's about it. So big, big difference in cost, big, big difference in what you have to invest into this instrument uh, just to get a working functional syringe again, right? So you got two options here, either replace the whole thing or replace the plunger tip only, and that will save you a little bit of buck so you can use that money and those Franklins somewhere else. All right, so I've got two different videos here. Uh, again, uh, kind of showing you a little bit about what they're doing, uh, just a little bit of motion. That's the only difference here. So let me pull those up so you can see those. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, replacing the syringe tip. So what you're going to see is them opening the door up, and then when they open the door up, you're going to see them zoom in on the syringe, and that syringe is going to get a little bit closer. They're unscrewing the airline. They're unscrewing the thread at the bottom to completely remove the syringe out, and then a new syringe in totality will come in. You slot it back up, and then the screw gets threaded back onto the end of that to secure the location. And then the airline finally comes in here to the side. So that's all there is to changing a syringe. That's it. So in the next video, I'm going to show you just them exchanging the plunger tip. So this video is going to start out with the syringe out, and you're seeing them take the insert out. Uh, they'll bring it enough, they'll cut the plunger tip off, and then this just slides off of there. The new plunger tip goes inside of the seat, and then the stem of the needle goes down inside. You give it a good twist, and then all of a sudden you have a mounted plunger tip that's now onto the syringe insert. So that gets inserted back into the syringe, and then this, again, just gets reseated back into the instrument like you saw in the previous video. That's it, folks. It's all there is to exchanging a plunger tip or exchanging a syringe. That's all. However, one of the things I do want to say is that any time you exchange this needle, any time you change out that plunger tip, whenever you are messing with this syringe that's in the front, you always, always want to go back and do what we call a zero point detection, all right? The zero point detection resets the syringe back at the proper level. What do I mean by that? Well, you've just messed with the syringe. You've just messed with the stem. You've just messed with everything on the front of that machine. And that machine has to reset itself so it knows exactly where the graduation marks are on the syringe. For instance, how does it know where five milliliters is at? Okay, it doesn't have eyeballs like you do. It can't see where the five milliliter markings at. It has to go by distance. That's how it works. So all of these graduated marks onto the side here, those are great for you to eyeball to see if it is inj injecting the proper amount, but it, to it, it doesn't really see those markings.
it has to rely on distance and the zero point detection is for that purpose. Okay, so this is what happens. In the zero point detection, it's going to focus on the syringe and it understands that you just did something to it. So it needs to reset itself. That's why you initiated the zero point detection. So it's going to come in and it's going to pull the syringe back. And you'll hear it. And then what it will do is it will take the syringe and it will push it back up. Up, 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 up. And it will get closer to the very top. Well, it does it in little baby steps. So after it goes so far, it says, hey, that was pretty good. I didn't get stopped. I wasn't at the end of the syringe. So it pulls it back again. And the second round, it goes up even further. And it gets closer to the end and it stops. And it says, you know what? I really didn't get stopped there either. So I'm not at my zero marking yet. So it will do it a third time. It pulls it back. And then it will slowly push up again. And this time it goes even further and it pushes it all the way up to the top. And then it gets pushed back because it can't go any further. And it knows at that point, that distance, that is the zero mark. And it will reset itself and it will recalibrate it itself. That's how the zero point detection works. So it really three steps. It pulls it back, pushes it a little further, pulls it back pushes it further up, pulls it back, pushes it further up until it gets to the point where it gets that resistance and it gets some fight back. All right. So that zero point detection resets the syringe in the proper spot. You have to do this every time you change the syringe out. Not only that, but there's going to be some maintenance maybe in some of the laboratories that tell you to do it even if you didn't tamper with the syringe. This is a way that we can constantly ensure that the proper amount is getting injected every single week or every single day. It doesn't take a lot of effort to get this done. It takes just a few minutes of your time, maybe every single morning for you to do this, but this is a way that we can ensure the proper injection amount. Uh, how do you get to this zero point detection? It's very easy because it's something that's commonly done. What you're seeing on the screen right now is the software. The software of the TOC instrument, up here at the very top, you're going to see the instrument tab. And when you click that instrument tab, you will normally see this drop down box. And this box, one of these options will be maintenance. And under the maintenance tab, you will see a zero point detection that's going to be listed here. That's all that you got to do. It's a couple of clicks. That's it. All right. So that's what I'm saying. When you open up the software in the morning before you run anything at all, maybe you want to go up to the instrument, click it, click maintenance, click zero point detection. And within two to three minutes, that syringe is going to be reset. It knows exactly where the zero mark is, and it knows how much to pull in and how much to pull out. All right? So that is the point of the zero point detection. Anytime maintenance happens on the syringe, I keep saying it over and over and over because it's very important. You have to do the zero point detection. You have to do it. Well, if a company wants you to do it every day, you do it every day. But anytime that syringe is tampered with, you have to go through this before you use the machine again. All right. Uh, here's another picture of the entire assembly now that you're getting more familiar with the TOC instrument. And again, this is a diagram that I could give you on a test or on an assignment. And I'll say, what are the pieces and parts called? I don't want you to label everything here. I've only picked out the most important pieces. So up here at the top is number one. And that number one is the injector, injector motion, not injection motor, injector motor. All right. Either one. I'd be okay with that. Right. Uh, number three is the actual eight point valve. And that eight point valve is right there. We've talked about how to unscrew that off and replace that piece of plastic literally on the inside of it and then reattach it and then reattach the motor on top of it. Number five, you now know is your syringe and we know the importance of that syringe and the three functions of that syringe. It's to inject and it's to mix 
and it's to purge. Again, very, very important. You're probably going to see a question on that as well. Uh, number seven and number eight, this is the washer and the screw that sits on the end of that syringe. This is what helps pull that plunger in and out to inject your sample up and to push your sample into the machine. So seven and eight has to be retightened. And then what's left off of here is maybe an extra number. And that extra number is going to be number nine. I'm going to write it in. And number nine is the airline. And they did not draw it, but you see the entry port right here. So this is going to be the airline that goes into that syringe that will begin to bubble and purge those or organics out of your sample. Again, it's only the purgeable organics, not the non-purgeables, of course, right? Okay, so there's your schematic of the injection site of the TOC instrument, and I think that you're getting more and more familiar with the pieces and parts. So again, don't be surprised if you see this image at another time on another date for a different purpose, and hopefully you can go through and kind of label especially 1, 3, 7, and 8 in that diagram. Uh, number two, number four, number six, uh, we're not really going to talk too much about. Those are more electronic types of pieces, more mounting brackets and that kind of thing. Uh, it really doesn't mean any kind of importance to us at this point, so I'm going to leave those off. So I've only really focused on the major pieces that actually do some important work for us, and that's one, three, five, seven, and eight. So be familiar with those. Make sure you can regurgitate those back onto a sheet of paper, and you'll be okay. All right, so this is where this video is going to stop. And in the next video, we're going to go back and we're going to focus now on the combustion tube. Uh, we are now past the syringe and we are going to take the sample into the next area and that syringe is going to inject it into what we call the combustion tube. So in the next video, that's where we'll pick up and we'll talk about maybe some important aspects of the combustion tube that goes on with my TOC analyzer.